The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Raising capital or taking your business to the world? Investment Fix has everything you need to make it happen. This season, we're exploring the US market, the opportunities it offers, what it takes to grow a business there, and the best way to approach investors. The Investment Fix Podcast. Tune in today. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No mai, hoki mai, kia The Fold, e mihi ne, ko Duncan Greer, tōku ingoa. My guest today is Chris Parker, who... I mean, you all know who he is. He's he's a, a legend of the industry, despite being only thirty two years old. Uh, I, I think what what makes him so interesting is is just how kind of sl- slippery you know his his talent is. You know, he he can he's he's got like you know kind of a lot of almost classically trained elements to to how he does things but he's very comfortable operating on like Instagram as a medium he did celebrity treasure island which is you know basically to to a lot of arts fundy type people about as crass and and unmentionable as you could get and we talk a lot about that and his case for sort of defending it is just chef's guess to me but he also did Hudson and calls at the silo and is is really very comfortable working in kind of basically the most kind of elite aesthete type spaces as well. Uh, we're here to talk about a book that he did, which, you know, full confession, I picked up an hour before the interview, but what I read of it was like, you know, this guy's a lovely writer, and which of course he is. Uh, and he's also, you know, written a play which, or, or multiple plays, which I think are, are just fantastically structured and 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 hilarious in their own right uh, he's a comedian obviously he's a felter his his work is now at, at the Auckland Museum and just he's a lot of different things and you know he's he's a he's a publicly gay camp super camp dude who who really likes exploring that and and making that interact with New Zealand in ways which at times kind of cause tension and, and at times, you know, make us, I think, much more often make ourselves see ourselves as a country in a much more kind of realistic and broad way that just allow space for more of us to be more of who we are. And he's just, he's just, a, just a magic guy and... Uh, and, and I think what he also is is just a really candid person. And so in this episode, we talk we talk about camping, we talk about Celebrity Treasure Island, but we also talk about the fact that he has still never really been able to make his dream project because there are just, you know, structural things that don't seem to change in, a, in our sort of cultural economy. And, you know, the, the Flight of the Concords example still kind of feels very present in the life of every creative in New Zealand. And that is something that there's an opportunity to change. You know, the merger is coming up that, that should, by rights, create a whole lot of opportunity to make new public media for new forums that is more in the image of the the dream project of of a creative as opposed to something which will do a job for an audience in a time slot, which is a whole behavior sequence that's really going away anyway. Uh, so look, it's a it's a really wide ranging conversation. Uh, I, I I just have been you know I first saw Chris on stage at camping and I was just absolutely blown away. I've I've really seen a performer with that much kind of electric energy who just really commits as much as he did. Uh, that show has really stayed with me and everything he's done since has just made me more and more convinced that this is one of our, our most rare and special talents and he deserves every opportunity uh, that comes to him. So this is me <laughs> fanboying out uh, with Chris Parker on The Fold. Morena Chris and welcome to The Fold. Thanks for having me here. I'm so excited. An honor to be here. No. The most serious podcast about media. <laughs> <laughs> I, is it? it probably is. It's probably a bit earnest, but um, hopefully we can, can we can deal with that. No, I like it. It's like when 
you used to when you used to get like a met. I shouldn't mention the M word here, but when you people used to get like Metro. How no me, Metro? Yeah, when you used to get like a Metro, was... like a write up about you, and then you have a couple of photos. I was like, that was like you knew you'd made it, and now I'm like, get me in the fold. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, I, I love the way you're talking. Please don't stop. Um, I actually reread your Metro profile as part of my. Oh, I've done one of those. Like, t- tense preparation. It was gorgeous. Yeah, like, it's like, beautiful. Yeah, it was very lo- lovely writing and. There's actually a few things I want to talk to you about within it, but but we'll, we'll get to that. Well, I wanted to start, because the last time I saw you, you were at uh, the All Blacks, I think. Oh, I got COVID that night. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> so I was going to say, you must have great memories. I, I don't know, I because I, I feel like there's this there's this beautiful tension in you that I kind of want to explore in this interview about where, where they're... Where, where there's like the super broad thing that you kind of enjoy doing in almost like a like a, a touristy way, and then there's this this whole other kind of <laughs> aesthetic thing. And there's high, low, and broad and narrow, and it's just all all in he, you. He loves it all. I, yeah, he's a man of contradictions. So, so <laughs> apart from your getting COVID, what, what did you make of the experience? What I loved about going to the rugby, well, they engaged with me the All Blacks Instagram account and asked if I wanted to go along. And I was like, ah, huh, interesting. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, it is interesting. Like it was, it was a vibe shift for them. Yeah. Having you and a bunch of other young colleagues. I was like, why do they want me there? And I was like, but I'm keen to go. And then I thought it was a beautiful opportunity to have my father along because he um, loves rugby. <laughs> And I love showing him how successful I am because <laughs> I need his approval. <laughs> so I was like, I'll take it to the rugby, two birds. And then I loved walking into the door just seeing who else had cracked the All Blacks PR list because I think it's a supreme PR list because uh, it's, you It's know, the best room in New Zealand, right? Like in terms of all the crazy people you see in no there. one's talking about it. Like no one's like, oh yeah, I'm on the All Blacks. They're quite quiet about it because they want to hold on to it because it's actually worth something. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was just like, oh, all these people popping up. I was like, oh, you're here and you've made it here and you've made it here. All you people who don't mention it. So I enjoyed that. And then I realized as, you know, heaps of wives were coming up to me and chatting to me, I was like, oh, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm like casually entertaining people that are like have been brought along who might not be as interested in the rugby, but they could like, Tom Sainsbury and I were like, you know, we had like lines of people wanting to meet and chat to us, and I was like, "Yeah, I see. we I see why we're here." I don't think that's actually why you're here, but that's actually just like a great bonus for them. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so we're here to talk about your book, which I must confess to having picked up an hour ago. So I haven't quite finished it yet. No, I'm. It's been the joy of um, chatting about this book across various media outlets. Is the amazing juggle of talking about it to someone who's read the first 10 pages, <laughs> but want, they're wanting to be like, I'm interested in reading it and not letting it up. But I'm like, you don't need to, it's fine. You know, like we don't need to give it all away, but I just love the facade of like, I'm, I'm getting into it. <laughs> <laughs> that is a real Apart from Hodaki, where they were like, we haven't read it, but it smells fantastic. And I was like, okay, at least you, you guys are the most honest people in media at the moment. Well, I think that also that that's like a, the, a proud ignorance is a real core part of the current Hodaki brand. Yeah, it really is. Um, but but the opening page, which is as far as I've got, so I, I'm not even 10 pages deep, <laughs> but I, I've, been, I've been out of the country for, for, for a period of time. I have some kind of plausible deniability uh, <laughs> There. And Jane also just messaged me like uh, yesterday afternoon to say you'd put with the thing in pillful. Look, I, Do you, I, I can't. There's lie. no. Ex- you don't need to apologize. You know, you know I'm a fan. I wouldn't re- yeah, exactly. Right. But we don't need to pretend like you've read the book. But yeah. on the first page, you talk about McDonald's and Young Entertainers, which I love as being the first cultural reference point encountered. And I also just love the way that you talk about it. I think that that. Like I've got a lot of affection for the kind of 90s and 2000s in New Zealand culture because it was the last broad era before everything shattered into a thousand kind of niches that, that were served on, on a vertical video screen. And you talk uh, about that in the book as well. Um, what, what is it about that, that show that, that kind of spellbound you and became such an aspirational thing that never to be achieved but in some ways always still in you? Uh, there's a couple of things. I mean, first and foremost, it was like, yeah, it was the time where TV, to be on TV meant something. And you were like a star if you were on TV because like everyone was, it was our only direct, you know, entertainment source was yeah. just the one, was the box. And it was everyone. And know? it was everyone, you know. It's a sh- shows had to be broad and tick a lot of boxes. But then also we didn't, 
we weren't competing. So you could also get away with like really weird ideas. And um, I just grew up, I was a kid that grew up on TV. Like mum would just, there's four kids in the house and mum's just like, I don't care, turn it on, <laughs> like eat your biscuits, watch the TV, <laughs> I'm, I'm done. And um, so we just watched so much TV, but I was more into, yeah, like McDonald's Young Entertainers just felt like a show that would never get made now. Uh, and what was interesting about it is a show that was about excellence, like performing performance excellence and like talent. Uh, and this is kind of before the, the sort of pop stars, American Idol thing where it was like, we watched it for the train crash of these people that thought they were talented, but actually they weren't talented. And imagine that this was like, these kids were the super troopers and everyone that entered this competition were entering because they thought they were talented and the judges thought they were talented as well. And it was a show that championed being good and being proud, which goes against this like tall poppy thing we've got in this country where we don't sort of share our gifts. And I just love the glitz and the glam of it. And I just thought, that's the life for me. Like, how do you get there? How do you, be, like, I just so wanted to be a super trooper. I think maybe for the fame, but I think actually for the performance opportunity. Like I wanted, they wore these like black Nike dance boots. <laughs> and I just remember like so wanting a pair and then just being able to like perform and dance and sing. And they were kids like me, they were my age. So I thought it, it's, it's possible. I guess I was seeing myself up there. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is like it's. It was just a, a different kind of era in terms of what you know. Like th there was a sort of an earnestness about it, and and I think it was like New Zealand just getting over the the worst of its kind of cultural cringe in some respects and being comfortable, not just like how do we make our thing like everyone else's thing, and just having a bit of a a sense of itself. Yes, but then also kind of before we arrived at this point where we were sort of trashing on ourselves. Like we were, it, it was sort of before that time, yeah. which sort of came in the late nineties, two thousands. And then that sort of like jackass era suddenly was like so prevalent where it was like just, you know, nailing each other down, and like, <laughs> you know, like shaving cream in your pants. Ah! And the sort of hyper masculine sort of prank culture then just took over. And I felt like that then just sustained Till John and Ben. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, it sounds, sounds a little like a show that you, you've you worked on a little. Yeah, I know. But then it was like before that time, it was like, you know, you could get away with shows that were about like singing and dancing and playing the clarinet or whatever on TV. And then <laughs> it just this crazy like MTV generation took over and it was all sort of noise from there. So, I mean, and that's basically, like I said before, I think that you do this high-low, you know, like you're, you've got, Te Papa and uh, and the Auckland Museum scrapping over over your felting, but you know you're also very comfortable on Instagram. You've done sort of you know really high high end theatre, but also reality television, and you don't seem to feel conflicted in that. Like whereas some people I know, they feel like it compromises their position as an artist mm. to, um, I know. To, to, to to do something which is kind of trashy and broad? How do you sort of resolve that? It's such a good question. And I feel like this is the thing that most people grapple with when making those decisions. Because like, you know, the idea, you know, the um, option to do Celebrity Choose Your comes under a lot of people's noses and then they sort of question whether they should do it or what if it's selling out. And I think ultimately underneath it all is this, like, all I'm trying to do is reach the biggest audience possible. And so to do that, you have to, you don't have to sell out, but you have to find the avenue. You have to go to them. You can't expect everyone to come to you. And I also believe you can make anything good out of any opportunity you've been given. And like, I think Treasure Island is the perfect example of that. I don't think that show had like a incredibly strong reputation heading into it. I think their reboot was good, like with Maddie and... Um, it was fine. Shannon. It was fine, yeah. But it was like, it was kind of interesting. It was high production, it, but it was sort of like, oh, you know, you saw the comment section, all these people think they're celebrities or all that kind of thing. Yeah. And then the opportunity came to me to do it and you're kind of heading into it with this idea that it's going to be a, like a weaker version of the previous season because that's how it usually works yeah. until it just dies out. You get three seasons <laughs> and, it, and then yeah. by the end suddenly, you know, you've got Jordan from on The Bachelor and it's yeah, just exactly. falling apart in front of you. <laughs> no, like, just, just give her a kiss, please. <laughs> we just need a bit no. of TV. No, no, no I don't want to do it. I don't want to show off. So I was like, you know, actually, 
you can make this what you want it to be. Like, I believe in my skills as a as a comedian, as an improviser. I know I can be funny in this format. I could be funny in any format that I'm given. So I'm going to have a go at it. And I didn't realize what we were kind of doing until halfway through it. And I was like, oh my God, this is such a good art form. I love the art form of reality TV because I just get to make TV. Like, and making TV takes so long. Yeah, but but you're just making TV. You know, you, you, there's not, nothing nothing else. So that's why I think it's a like as a format, Celebrity Treasure Island specifically. You know, it's it's a weird thing to have been just sort of sitting in the basement and then to to come out. I, I, so many things had to come together to make that season so special. You know, even just down to when it aired uh, dur- during hundred percent. But the casting was special. Like, did you did you know who else was going to be on it? And when when you sort of saw it, did you was it was it a process of figuring that out or was it quite early on? I, I was like, oh, there's a bit of a vibe here. I think when I weirdly when I heard that Art had done it was uh, was signed up for it. You know, I was like, okay, this is interesting because he's, you know, he's got a real brand and he's part of that like premiere season of The Bachelor, you know, the season that has at him and Matilda Rice in my eyes are just like, you know. Reality TV Mount Rushmore. Exactly. And like as superstars. Yeah. <laughs> New yeah. Zealand reality superstars. We don't really have those. And like, yeah. um, I was like, oh, wow, interesting that he signed up for this. This is going to be cool. I think they're all, people are kind of engaging it in a really interesting way. And then um, what I thought was really special about our season as well was just the amount of comedians that were on and giving so us much. the space just to be funny and make funny TV. And um, I think it's a real... I've always encouraged comics who have been I mean, an houring over to do that show. I've been like, you should do it because it's a comedy jackpot because you know, everyone begins to learn the universe of that show and then you get to narrate it and you get to comment on it and you can do your references and make whatever jokes you want and you've got all these references to pull from and the audience who've been in this world for so long get it. So you're just like the funniest guy on the island. So why not, why wouldn't you want to be there doing that and like making jokes? So it was like, and I once I'd realized that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so powerful, so fun. And then now on the other side of it, seeing the audience that it engaged with, it's like, who am I to think I'm not, I'm too good for that. That's what I keep thinking. Like this is reaching the the widest possible audience, huge, ginormous. I'm so shocked every but, time I'm around the country, who will come up to me and talk to me about that show. And I'm like, who am I to think I'm above this? It's just a beautiful normie thing, right? Like, and, and in that way, it almost harks back to young entertainers because it has that thread of just like, it, it, it spoke to people who are just in there and I'm just like, take me out of this terrifying delta hell. Yeah. And put me on a much colder than it should be beach <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Um, and, and take me away from reality for a minute. And that's, you know, origin stories of television as a medium. We just don't get an opportunity as well to introduce ourselves as performers properly in this mm. country. Like it's quite difficult. I feel like we're suddenly thrown into Treasure Island or thrown into Mars Singer, and it's like after sort of doing two years on Shortland Street, and people are sort of like, "Who? Who is that?" You know, and it's because they haven't had enough time to sit with us and get to meet us and see what our our work is and what we're about, and so. It was just such a great introduction. There's, there's Even though a, I've been working for so many years prior, it was an introduction. Yeah, to, to, to a particular like like concentric circle out of, of audience. And, and there's an intimacy to it because you're just, there's nowhere to hide. You're, there's nothing else to do. You're mm. just sat uh, interacting with with other celebrities uh, yeah. for such a, a long period of time, if you, if you do stick around as you did. Yeah, Dame Susan DeVoy, when she was, I was just watching the recent season and she's like, this isn't a show about challenges. This is a show about like the human condition. And I was like, it really is. Like it's, it's Aotearoa in a nutshell. Like it's, you get all these differences and then you take away social media and this like awful comment section and like the Twitter hot take fight and
and we have to have it out in person on the beach. And it's so refreshing to see that. I think it's the, you know, we will talk about something else, but obviously it's my favourite topic. But it feels like the canonical reality TV show for New Zealand, the same way that Married at First Sight is Australia's and Love yes. Island is the UK's. We are, we are embodied in the country in this objectively ridiculous show where all, like, because it's just all different types of New Zealander, all different ages and... Yeah you know, genders, like all these different identities and we, they just got to figure it out in this like just shithole, but like a beautiful shithole, but like it's just camp is rough. I love saying, I love you saying that it's like, yeah, like New Zealand kind of owns this show in a way, but I think we, oh, we're still getting there and I hope we still try to watch it more and get into it more. And I think I get jealous of the way that Australians talk about like their shows and like there is discourse or in the UK with um, Love Island, like the way that they have that discourse and they have fandoms and they get passionate. And I was like, I remember launching into our season and being like, I really want the audience to sure, like the support with in terms of the viewing numbers would be great, the ratings. But I just feel like the joy of reality TV is like the fandom of reality TV. Okay. And it's like, if we can just ask them or just set up that framework to be like, we want you to be fans of the show. Just like play along. It's a permission system that we need. You just have to ask them if they want to do it. And then a lot of the people are like, yeah, like they kind of want to. Yeah, and they, like don't worry about losing your cool. Yeah. It's, like the con it's a construct. It has no meaning. I just love as well the people that are like, yeah, I don't usually watch reality TV, but I did watch that season. I just It was really entertaining. I was like, well, maybe that's not on the reality TV's fault. Yeah. Maybe you're just it. unnecessarily resistant. Just wasting your time on these kind of mid-brow yeah. Netflix shows. Exactly. <laughs> I know. Like, at least it knows it's trash. Yeah. You know, like it yeah. knows it's what it is. It's so self-aware. Versus like, yeah, whatever sort of like Netflix series is trying to be like a, the latest cutting edge HBO, whatever. It's like, I'm, I'm just missing. So it's Yeah, it's soulless. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out of home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, Jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right, and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call, or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. The first time I saw you... Uh, ever. Ever, was camping. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I knew... Which I don't even know, almost know why I was there. Like it was during this period when I, for sort of semi-professional reasons, tried to go to like three comedy festival shows a night, and and they were great. It was a great era. Like it was when a lot of your, your generation of comics were sort of coming up, doing their first or second hours, and and they were it, there was like a, an electric kind of current passing through it all. But then camping was just so different. Like it, it, it aspired to so much more. It was easily the funniest thing I saw. Like I. I often fell asleep at the 10 o'clock shows. That's, oh, yeah. that's on me. No, no, that's not on you. Well, no, well, it, it's, it's, it's very hot in there. It's hot. It is too late. Uh, it's too late, yeah. But, but this was a 10 o'clock show, and I, there was no chance. I was just like, I was, in, I was like, it was a workout. It was so funny. So was that, was that show just per, like pivotal to me, or, or did that, that, no. that show break things for you too? Oh, my God. That is the moment, like, for me. Like, that is, and when I look back, for like the 10 years I've been doing it. Like, but that is the moment that I just felt like, because going into that project, all I wanted to create with Tom was a cult sensation. Like, <laughs> I was like, what does it feel like to create? I was so inspired by like Rocky Horror and just like what it is to create something that feels culty and 
weird and like and so we sort of were pulling heaps of references from Rocky Horror in terms of like you know your Brad and your Janets and kind of going to this this car ride and going to this batch and then it was the first time that um, Tom and I had done work together but Brinley Stent was new to Auckland and we were like we've got to have her on board and then we were like oh and who else who would be the the fourth person we're like oh what about Kutta Forrester and well, what a what a quarter I know and like she Kutta was already like in everyone's eyes, the funniest person around um, and had done like, but was still like heaps of like serious theater stuff. And, but she'd done it like the odd show, but we were like, come and do camping. And then the four of us, it was like, oh my God. Like the chemistry was unbelievable and it just clicked. And the first performance of camping was an hour 25 yeah, I think I might, so might even long. have been there. It would last it for forever, but it was... So, I mean, if for the unlucky few, which is yeah. probably most of and you... so many people, because we performed it honestly to like <laughs> 500 people, but I was like, it is the moment. It, and it felt like that. Like, so it's a, it's a play, effectively. So Tom and I... So, so explain, explain it to those who missed it. Well... So the comedy festival was coming up and Tom Sainsbury and I were wondering about like what offering we should give. And this was after I'd done um, a fairly like heavy comedy work the year before called No More Dancing in the Good Room, which was like an autobiographical coming out like dance comedy work. It was so inaccessible, but really good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was like, what do you do to follow up on, on that? And then it was like, I know, like just change, just do something completely different. And I was like, I actually want to do a play in the comedy festival. I feel like a play no one's doing, like make it a play. Like it's like we're in character, we're in costume, we're wearing wigs. And I was also off the back of doing Hudson and Halls around the country and had recently clicked into this idea of New Zealand's affinity with campness, which feels at odds in terms of our national identity, but was like, wow, we really love campness and we don't realize it like we love Graham Norton and we love like the top twins and there's a sort of inherent campness to this uh, this country that because it's camp we're not totally aware of yeah um, it's, and that's the power of campness it's like you don't know why you're drawn to it and so I was kind of running with that and I was like well let's call the show camping because um, it's like the whole mission about it is it to be for it to be like a New Zealand exploration of camp and so we wrote this sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's actually, no one knows where it's set, but it's probably set in the 70s, this play. Yeah, I feel the vibe <laughs> hugely But 70s. they could just be like dated, you know, in yeah. terms of their style. I think that's the, they could be aliens. Like it's not really, and it's two couples who book a honeymoon retreat. There's one couple that's on the brink of divorce and one couple that's recently been married. And it's very clear that both husbands in the relationship are homosexuals, but are like closeted. And then the two women are like, they sort of connect as well. So it's this unlikely pairing in a, in a batch together as it rains and spend like a couple of days together. And it all ends with them taking magic mushrooms taking their clothes off to reveal these nude suits that we've been wearing for the whole show and doing this orgy that Tom Sainsbury choreographed and it had about 36 sexual positions in it. It was like explicit sex. And then the end of the story is that it worked for them. Like all they needed to do to solve all their problems was to just let it out and all have sex with each other. And um, the reaction in the room doing it was just like unlike anything I've experienced uh, in a theatre it just you it was just it had a cult energy about it like the audience were going crazy for it and we kept joking being like have we just created end of the golden weather like like <laughs> but that's I what think we kept you saying have, but, you know <laughs> and like could it would be like i think we've written the new um, end of the golden weather like it just we we felt like we had made the next great new zealand play that was only performed to 500 people but we were just so intoxicated on this risk that we'd made that had then paid off. Well, it's, and it's also, I think, because it felt like it it was both super affectionate about a lot of New Zealand tropes and and also had heaps of fun with them. And then the, like the way that it just sort of lent into that and, and, and exploded it. And it's just, it, yeah, I mean, like, uh, it, it's, it's this funny thing because I'm like, did I dream that? Because it felt like, Orders of magnitude, like better. That like there was a, it was a great era, and this was just so much 
better and different. It was almost it's just like a different galaxy. Have you have you returned to it? Like, what, what, should it run again? Like, it feels weird to yeah. have the end of the golden weather. We always talk about bring it back. We yeah. always talk about bring it back. And we did a return season at the Q Loft. And it was great. Like, again, it went off. But it just didn't have that energy of being in the... It just that the, show the small felt so room. in the basement. Yeah. Um, and I still kind of want to turn it into, like, a movie or something. Yeah. Because I feel vibe. like that's the next step uh, is to, like, film it in a way and uh, really kind of make it sort of surreal and odd and a bit art house, but a bit culty and give it that kind of Rocky Horror treatment where you sort of can't believe what you're watching, but you sort of love the references and the everything that's going on. I think that'd be like a dream project, but it's like, how does that happen in this country? Because it feels like the only way you can take those risks sometimes is in the basement to 100 people, which is why when you see something good at the basement, it's the best thing you'll ever see. Okay. I, I'm, I'm multiple times in this podcast talked about the basement and what a a special, crucial kind of oven it is for to make things. But then, and, and this kind of almost goes to something which is honestly like a, a topic that comes up heaps on here, which is like, you know, because it does feel natural that that should become a movie. And yet it seems to be a frustration with a lot of comics I talk to and musicians and people who are just trying to make stuff in, in this country is like, how do you get your big, like, if you, if you sit at the start of your career and say, look, I'll just do work, but I want this one thing, you know, like how do we give people their one thing rather than having, because it, it feels like the machine just slowly goes, hey, can you just do breakfast radio for like 15 years and then a bunch of like sort of format shows and then just by the end of it, you won't want to do your thing anymore. You won't even remember what it was. And it's like, because I think there's a beautiful thing we have in New Zealand and and that the, these like the creatives that we produce here are just ridiculous. Mm. But it almost says, if you want to make your beautiful thing, that's cool, but just go go to London. And I don't want, I don't think that that should be our natural reaction. Well, the big story that I feel like everyone always references is like the Concord story. Right. You know, and I feel like that, that story exists because it sums up this industry so beautifully and what it is like, which is like they were turned down time and time again until they became the most powerful <laughs> people in the comedy landscape internationally. And then finally, they was like maybe given a chance with TVNZ, you know. And it's like <laughs> when you and you hear that story when you are uh, beginning to like pitch as a as a comic in this country. It's like, but just remember the Concord story, and then you find yourself eventually like four or five years into it, rejection after rejection, being like, oh, <laughs> it's not like that. It's the Concord's effect, yeah. Or you know, like we all go through that. And like, you know what? It's interesting because I feel like you reviewed camping and we like, obviously we use the pull quote all the time, which is like Parker and Sainsbury are like, you know, comedy, whatever. And the fact that they haven't had a show greenlit yet is like the biggest result of like the, the you know, the damages of this industry. What, I can't remember what it was, but it was like, we just, I felt like there was hope there because I was like, oh, someone can see that Tom and I are like ready to be given a shot but it's never going to happen because no one's going to trust that. And even now, like... Do you still feel that way? No. Like, obviously, Tom and I have, like, proven well, you've got, you've got amazing careers individually, but it, it did feel like you were a duo, and it did feel like you were we, due a, a big... Like show. A, yeah, like a... Like a here's two <laughs> million bucks. Go, to do go mad. <laughs> we would love to do it. And we, Tom and I... It's, like, so interesting. And I think something that, like, totally is, like indicative of this industry in this country is like Tom and I work so well together. Yeah. You know? So you're like, oh, there we go. And like, if you went down to the basement or the or Q, like you did, and saw that, you'd be like, oh, well, there it is, plain and simple. These two guys love working together. And they're great. So surely you should get them to work. But what happens is... Because the commissioners do that. They go down. They're yeah. in the audience. But then you know, the step is, I guess, like the production houses create their own show and then they think about their audiences. And then you have Tom doing a show with like Paula Bennett, you know, like that's like um, charades mm. and me doing a show somewhere else with someone else, you know, like, you, and then we don't get to work together. And I don't, I don't understand why that happened because I'm like the magic is when we can be together, working together and doing what we want to be doing. And then, but like, even now I still have these conversations like with certain like network people where like, I was trying to pitch a show that was going to be me, Tom, Brinley and Kutta. And like show. exactly. It is a great show. And we pitched it and the feedback was like, we're not sure if it's, 
going to be broad enough. It's really interesting that... That, and that was like two years ago. And I was like thinking to myself, Tom's the biggest name we've got at yeah. the moment in this country. Was Kota on Shorten Street at the Kota time? Kota was on the peak of Shorten like, Street. Tr- like- Brindley, Brindley was Billy T nominated. Like, I just... And it's like, it's not broad enough. We just don't think people are going to want to watch it. And so we've still got the pitch and it's still there. I think it's awesome. I think it's funny. And I guess people don't trust creatives. It's weird, right? Like it, it, it does feel like it, it has to come in through a particular door. And if a great idea comes in through the wrong door, you're like, I don't know if I, that, that door's not a good door. That, that this, is, this is our good door. Like that, what works, I feel like in the UK model is that it's like often uh, performer driven. So it's like, let's find a vehicle for Rose. That's yeah. a feel, you know? It's like, what does Rose want to make? But the vehicle isn't a format that is imposed on the performer. It's no. something that the performer wants to What's make. What's your vehicle? Like, yeah. what do you want to make? And then it will work because you are, it's coming from you, you're passionate about it, and it's your taste. So they trust you. Whereas here, often I feel like it's like, well, here's our vehicle. Who th- will fit in it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, of course, they'll do a good job. They're a professional, but we're not moving forward in any way because it's not created um, driven. It is like vehicle driven. We're product takers rather than product makers. Yeah, and I was like, if we just talked, I mean, it just it just would never work. I guess I've in a way lost hope. I don't know that it would never change. I don't think it would ever change. So that's what I wanted to know because I feel like that 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 is almost the above it all the most heartbreaking thing to me because – you of all people seem like you have seen this country. Like you've looked really hard at it. You love it. You find it hilarious. You think you can help it grow mm. by, by the way that you contribute work to it. The, these kind of loving, hilarious characters you create on Instagram, to, mm. to, to, you know, everything. So like it shouldn't be that to, to grow. Like I, I've always admired people who stick it out here, even though they obviously have all world talent. But the driver away being to, to make the things that you want rather than, you know, like there's heaps of really valid reasons to want to go overseas. And like, I also don't want to sound like I'm ungrateful. Like I've been given heaps of opportunities. You don't. Um, but I am just like, I'm just, I think if it's a true of me, then it's true of everyone else, right? Like, and all the other amazing talent that I see around me that I'm like, I hope, like people should be engaging with them, being like wanting to hear what they want to make um, and getting them in the room. And the fact that I'm not getting in the room, well, like I am in some rooms, but the fact that I'm not like kind of, I don't know, like talking to TVNZ or, you know, discovery about like what could be next or what we should be making. And I think it's just those conversations are so important because it keeps you around, but also like, I, I guess it's, I guess media is business but we kind of forget sometimes that it's also art that you're making and that good art comes from collaboration and conversation, but it feels like it gets made through business and I feel like that often loses a lot of the magic. Well, I, that's it's interesting to me, right? Because yes, it's business, but it's also business that is like 90% taxpayer funded. Mm. So, and that's, I, I remember I've, I've argued with various people from various media organizations and funders historically where, it feels like the desire to go broad and to serve an advertiser or to even generate a contribution from the network overrides the artistic impulse, even though the network's paying 10 cents in the dollar to make the thing. So wouldn't you rather, you know, you could even take more risk, sacrifice 20% potential audience in the in the hope of making something like transcendent rather mm. than something that is like its ceiling is just above mediocrity. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's just, um, I don't know. It's like, I guess I'm only trying to flag these as well is because, yeah, again, it's about the hope that other people, it's just taken so long, you know, in a way that I just hope that other people underneath who are still, who are where I was five years ago or whatever, trying to get their way in. It can just happen faster. Yeah. And those conversations can begin that because any show takes so long to get made that by the time you're ready to make it, like you're ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and you, you know, there's a finite amount of energy and time and, and your life situation. Because like all these things have to come together at once to make the show crackle. This year, like the beginning of this year, there was 
you know, I've been so lucky to have like various projects greenlit, you know, and they all kind of came at once. And it, you'd look at that now and think like, what are you talking about, Chris? Like you're saying that you're not attached to anything. You're attached to so many projects. But what's funny is like all those projects are like five, six years in the making. You know, they all they all turn over n- now. And I think that I was ready to make them three years ago. And I'm like, and in, in a way I'm like, yeah, you say I'm at the peak. And, and, and I also feel like, I'm, um, there's other people who are rising that are so, like it's, we've, it's like clogged, if, if that makes sense, like the pipe is clogged and it's not flowing through in a way that the talent who are like ready now to be given the shot that I'm being given now, they should be given it, be given, be, being given it two years ago, if that makes sense. No, it totally makes sense. It's just all, it's just too narrow a pipe. Yes. You but know, I guess that's this country, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But it does, yeah. It doesn't feel like there's we lack. We don't lack for the talent. We don't lack. I mean, maybe we lack a little for the audience. But we're making enough stuff. We're just not making. And then it goes the across. Right like Good Grief is a great example of something that's like been given the chance to be made, and then it's worked and it's transcended beyond the country, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then there are like multiple examples mm. of that at any given time, but it's weird that it has to go away to come back mm. in some respects. Anyway, let's talk about something that's a bit more exciting. As, as you know, I've read two, two <laughs> maybe even three paragraphs <laughs> yeah, over it. here for a good time. Uh, explain, explain it to me. What, like, what, where did this come from? Because this is something that you did have creative control over. The book came after Treasure Island. Obviously, so that that was one of the opportunities that just sort of lands in your lap because yeah, which I thought was really interesting. You yeah, know, like after winning that show, there were various publishers who were like, "Have you got a book?" And I think they probably you forget that like publishing is business as well. It's extremely business. Did you have a book? No. Did you have? Any, I knew what they wanted. Maybe I don't sure. Like, but did you want? Did you want to write a book, or was it just like this is work? I don't know. I think I don't know. At that point, I didn't know what I want. You know, like it's after just Trisha so Island. flattering to be asked, right? Yeah, we got asked. ego lovely. strokes. <laughs> and um, but I was like, I don't want it to feel like the the memoir that comes at the end of the career. You know, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. When I'm 32 and still running at this, and I know I've got more to do, and I haven't even like reached what I feel like I'm capable of. And I was like, oh, so to be writing a book that's like, and then. I was done. <laughs> felt so scary to me. So I was like, well, maybe like it could be an extension of my comedy or like another outlet. And like signing up for Treasure Island or whatever I've done in my career, like I won't sort of say no to an opportunity. I'll hear it out and see what's possible from it. And I was like, actually, you know, this could be a really interesting exercise and a project. And there's a lot to learn from this. And again, it's like it will reach new audience who might not necessarily want to come out or see me live or might just want to have me in written form. So it's um, they're like essays and it's short stories and it's like that sort of Sedaris type novel um, that weirdly though, it does tell a really interesting story underneath it because it sort of was written chronologically. And so each piece is trying to be something sort of short and um just like a separate idea, like haircuts I've had in my life or like dating. But then underneath that is this like burn of having to write a book in what is like a really busy year and also trying to live your own life at the same time. And then there's this chapter called Word Load, which is like me in Sydney where like all these deadlines are like clashing with each other. And I've said yes to too much. And I feel like I'm struggling and I don't know how to deal with being overworked. And then I was like, I'll just turn it into a chapter of the book. And then at least I'm getting more of the book written (laughs) while also dealing with this freak out that I don't know what to be like. I don't know how to move because I've got so many emails to answer. I mean, like uh, like I said, like I I have read more than three pages. I I sort of of skimmed that. But it's quite obvious that 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 lovely, precise, writing style that is and and you know the the way that you are in in your comedy there is just like it's that you you've got like a precision and you've got like a really beautiful voice and like like that is just it's manifest in it like so so did you in you know like 
did you enjoy that aspect of it? Be able to because you you know you mentioned I think in the the metro piece you talk about Miranda July who's you know that like mm. a, as a kind of an aspirational <laughs> per, yeah. person and I feel like yeah you know, I like the fact that you you know you don't hate the idea of doing a bunch of things. You don't view that as a kind of a negative tell. You're just like, I, I actually want to contain multitudes and I want to execute them all really well. Like there is that sort of slightly competitive streak in you that comes off. It's like, if I'm going to do a book, it's going to be fucking good just because that's the kind of shit I like to do. I just don't want to waste the opportunity or take that the opportunity for granted, you know? So you have to pour a bit of time and respect into it because someone's going to buy it someone's going to sit down with it and someone's like going to read it and give up their time to read a book. So I was like, well... It can't be a bad Chris Parker product either. You know, it's got your name on it. Well, exactly. I don't know. I do think there's just like a... Res- you do go like, oh my God, you've made like... I guess because our art form is so ephemeral, it just like dies in the night and then there's nothing to have for it. So you are like creating something, a product that's like in the world, takes like trees to make and you feel a bit sort of like if you're going to do it like don't waste it don't just sort of sell out and just get it done and put your face to it and it can be whatever like actually make use of it or like let it talk about something or move a conversation forward so I I enjoyed that aspect of it and it's so weird because like this job is you're always doing something for the first time and then you don't really get to try it again (laughs) like and and like implement what you've learned from the process of doing it for the first time. It's like after you've written the book, off you go to make the web series. And after the web series, like off you go to make a movie or whatever. And then all of those opportunities are given to you once and you need one crack at them and you learn all your mistakes and then you move on. But you never kind of get to go back and have another crack at it. But but I feel, also feel like you learn some weird tangential thing that ends up being useful in the next thing, even if it's not mm. doing oh, the totally. thing again. Well, this was all about just like, owning your own writing process because it's just you. Like you do have a publisher who will check that it's not an absolute pile of shit, but like, (laughs) well, you you sort of submit and then they'll kind of encourage you to keep writing. But apart from that, it is just you alone writing. Like it is a very solitary endeavor. Whereas most, even on stand-up, is alone, but you're still very much collaborating. And even when you're performing it, you've got an audience there. Whereas this is just like you alone writing it. And then thinking to yourself that someone's going to sit down and be like holding this and then actually reading the words. You're like, oh my God, that's a lot of time to be spent with an idea. I hope that idea is good enough. <laughs> I think it is. I think it is. By, by some of my in, intense uh, research, obviously. Uh, just before we go, and honestly, thank you so much. It's been like super fun and I love the candor. Uh, there's also a spin-off project coming yeah. uh, in a couple of months, which we're, we're going to reveal more of in time. But can you can you just te- tease it a little? Because I've... I love uh, me complaining. Like, I don't have any opportunities. And they'd be like, <laughs> here's a million um, opportunities I've been given. But um, I mean, Eli and I from do a podcast, Mail Gates, which we've been doing for like five years for like <laughs> no money. I don't know if we, anyone listens because we do like one episode a month. But... We, many years ago, made a web series, Male Gaze, for TVNZ On Demand, and we really wanted to make it like a second episode of it. And like nothing really, it just keeps that, keep getting no's. And, but we knew that it was something to be making, but I guess as well, we were like, oh, why are we getting no? Like we should make this series about something. And then we got thinking about like, what do we talk about the most about um, in uh, our podcast and what are we like curious about and it is our relationship with pornography because it's a really risque topic I've probably said too much but whatever um, but it's important for us so we've pitched you <laughs> <laughs> and because you guys are like woke and cool and like up to speed you were like okay let's go with this um, a series with Hexworks and spin off about pornography I'm I'm excited. I, I I love the the sort of audacity of of trying to get funding for something that's just like inherently and obviously unfundable. <laughs> like basically just handing like a, a loaded like a, like a ticking bomb to the, to the funder and being like, "What are you gonna?" Of all the projects I've ever worked on, this is the one that it, like has had the most meetings <laughs> about like what are we going to do when this gets released, and everyone's like on edge. And there's a little part of me that's like. It's fine. I think it might be fine, but it's definitely going to explode. No, I think is it? That, yeah, of course. Oh of course. I just like don't know what we've put ourselves in the center of. 
I mean, this is the best hype you could ask for. Like, but I'm just like up for that. I think I think it's I think it's as you say. Like, it's a it's a, a topic that is everywhere and completely undiscussed in public and has profound implications and has gone from being like like d- dirty mags that were sort of like passed around like like weird treasure, <laughs> weird gross sticky treasure, and <laughs> to to something that is just like it's just available for everyone all the time and it's, yeah. And it's is that fine? No, no age gate. I mean, and and, and is what's happening because that does not look fine. What I'm saying there. We're in like the lead up to like it finally. I mean, being released shortly and like going live with the name of it all, and we're in those like last moments of doubt. You yeah. Know, where you in any creative project where you're like maybe we should not do this, or like maybe it's, <laughs> now's a good time to just step back. But I keep saying to myself as like my motto is like, well, what? We don't discuss this. I know. That's my big thing. And so we're all like agreeing like, okay, we'll just have to be brave enough <laughs> to kind of begin the conversation and then um, we'll see where that leads us. I mean, it, almost Maybe, can't, it can't possibly be worse than, than the current no conversation. I know. I guess it's like the personal thing of being like, you're suddenly cancelled, I guess. I, I don't think. I think, you're, no. I think you're uncancelable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, well, that's a little test for the listeners. <laughs> Do your research, yeah. come back to us and go, see go how deep. you can, in fact, cancel me. <laughs> Amazing. Hey, thanks so much, Chris. This thanks has been such a, such a joy. It was fun. Awesome. The Fold was brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, together with Daylight. It was hosted by Duncan Greve, produced by T.I. Hair Butler, with production management by Rachel LaRue and series production by Jane Yee. That was The Fold, brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. K pop to me means more than just listening to music. It's learning to be myself. The spin off's new documentary, K Polly's, follows three Pacific youth obsessed with K pop. In a one off documentary, see what they've found in Korean pop culture and how they bridge it with their own. When you start dressing, looking different, everyone side eyes you. But in K pop, they're just like, no, like celebrate yourself. Watch K Polly's today at thespinoff.co.nz slash videos. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.